I started in the angling cot, leaving Valen slow to paddle down the sock and meet the others on Skolivar, the Dutch barge yacht. We travelled on down the river, past stories of the rise and fall of technology, through a hundred years of history. And more, a thousand years, fifteen hundred, my ancestors the Vikings fighting with my ancestors the monks. And all the time we had the feeling we were being followed. After the raid on Clonmacnoise, we pushed northwards into the interior of the country. The Shannon Current is against us. There's a touch of adversity in the air. We're heading for the town of the crossings, Athlone. The Vikings knew that this river was the artery of Ireland. If they could control it, they controlled everything. So they fought for it, fought against the Irish and fought amongst themselves. The Limerick Norsemen were the first victors, the Dublin Norse the last. Their principal weapons were boats, boats that could travel against the current. The Shannon divides the west of Ireland from the east, Connor from Leinster. But there is a shallows at Athlone, a fording place. Here horsemen, picking their way along the Esker ridges that meander across the soft red bog, could make their way from one kingdom to the other. Huge, designed to take Victorian passenger steamers. Skolovai is big, 40 feet, but she's dwarfed by the chamber. It's our first lock on this trip, but the routine is deeply ingrained. Everyone is in the right place at the right time. No hurry, no shouting. When you do it right, it's a bit like going up in a lift. The water fills the chamber, you float up a few feet, put the engine in gear, and you've gone up another step on the uphill journey towards the head of the river. One of the reasons why crossing places and border towns are important is that they're where different cultural traditions meet, mingle and change. The shallow summer flow coming over the weir is a reminder that this was the great ford on the border of Leinster and Connaught, and that it's always been a cultural treasure house, a temple of variety. So if you come by car or train and speed over a bridge, you might just possibly miss all this. You might whiz through without ever learning that the greatest of all Irish tenors was born in a Chinese restaurant. Now there's what I mean. Cultures cross-pollinating, confrontations at the frontier post. No, it's best to arrive by boat and with a thirst, and have the courage to penetrate up dark alleys in search of other strands in the weave of Athlone. It's a real. Is it? Yeah. Miss McLeod, Miss McLeod. Miss McLeod. Mm. I brought the box, you could have joined in. <laughs> I spent a lot of time quietly picking Dick's brains, feeding off the storehouse of experience and knowledge he's gained from a long lifetime on the water. It wasn't a bad day's run. Nice day's run, yes. 
We've got the lake tomorrow. Oh, yeah, lovely. Mm. You worried about it? No, no, no. no. In many ways, he's the ideal companion for a trip like this. Quiet, competent, not given to panic, but fond of a pint and a song. I'm kind of looking forward to it myself. Good luck. Yeah. Oh, mate. <laughs> Log of the Scolivar. Tomorrow we leave Athlone and head towards Loch Ree. The weather forecast is good, which is just as well. Lakes this size can be dangerous. We slip out of Athlone in the morning. Like many Irish river towns, it seems to turn its back to the water, almost as if it's ashamed of it. A bit of the glamour has dissolved with the night. Buildings seem grey and sober. I look forward to seeing more green to trees and reeds and callow land. Something else it has in common with other Irish towns, a skyline dominated by a church, a great Byzantine edifice crouching in symbolic mastery over the smaller buildings. The Victorian ironwork of the rail bridge is the best of the architecture around here. Also, I notice a very famous boat, the Fox. Skipper Sid Shine. He lives on board, a man who holds another strand in Athlone's weave of cultures. I came into uh, the business of my parents built the Crescent Ballroom in 1936 and uh, I inherited the job of resident, carried on the resident band there. I built up then to one of the biggest big bands in the country. I had a 13 piece, he used to carry four saxes, two trumpets, two trombones, bass, piano drums and did a lot of the big jobs in the country like Trinity Ball. And, big dances in the west of Ireland and that. Well, it's 1963, uh, the big band started to fade out and uh, as rock and roll came in, Bill Haley and the Comets put the tin hat on the big bands, I think. And uh, so if you can't lick them, you have to join them. So I started the Saints Show Band at that time. I don't remember when I wasn't in a boat, you see, because my father and my uncle, so I, you know, they all had, they all had boats. And uh, when I was 14, myself and two of my school pals bought an old yacht here called the Elfin for six pounds. And we put an engine into it, an old Model T Ford engine into it that we bought for a pound. And got it, got it, got it moving. And we started to do the whole shot at that time. And we're, we brought her, brought her up first time up to Lockheed, 1934. We thought that time we owned it all because we often went from Athlone to Carrick and Shannon and never met another boat on the way. From John McCormick to Sid Shine and the Saints, so many kinds of music, they make an easy metaphor for all the cultural strands that make up a modern Irish town. So the times when you could travel a day on the Shannon and never meet another boat are long gone. We won't be alone on our journey north, into the inner lakes, and then across the main body of Loch Ree to the Connaught shore. So much river travel is dominated by natural landscapes that it's quite a contrast to look at things made by people, bridges, houses, key walls and other objects crafted of masonry and metal. Monastic settlements are a recurring theme, but not all the monks are items of history. The Franciscans still have a community here. We're very much conscious here in Atlona as Franciscans of 
being, as we would say, at Lone's oldest family. We've been here for several hundred and fifty years, give or take a decade or two. You know, we're not worried about the exact figures. And when you're around that length of time, time ceases to interest you. You know, you're timeless. You're always here. But obviously, when you're talking about Ireland in the 5th, 6th century, when the monks first came to the place, it was a land of marsh, bog, wood. And the easiest way to get anywhere was water. We've been trying to forget nowadays you couldn't go out to your local supermarket in the 8th, 6th or 7th century. So you just went out to your local river or went into your local forest and caught a bird or two, whatever. So waterways were important for transport and for food. The importance of the river for both transport and food has declined. The underbelly of a motorway bridge reinforces the point. A lot of the islands here in Loch Ree were inhabited by these ancient monks. Uh, these were places where they could live undisturbed, relative peace and freedom. And even today, in our sort of living, where we live among people, deal with all sorts of problems of people, it can be a great rest to get off of an evening up to an island where nobody can get at you. It's getting away from the world in a very positive sense. It's to be where you can be alone with God. St. Francis in his own time went up to the top of mountains. Well, going out into an island is the same thing. Nobody's going to follow you out there. You can slow down your pace of life, get in contact with what's around you, and that way get in contact with God. St. Brendan the Navigator, Turgesius the Viking, Dean Swift's Gulliver, who came this way en route to Lilliput, and Goldsmith's country clergyman, passing rich on 40 pounds a year. As an Irishman, I carry ashore quite a weight of inherited baggage, and therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Hare Island has a barricade of woodland round its shores. Only the centre is open country. It's like a tonsured head, and the barricade is manned. No, manned is the wrong word, but there's something here. The raiders arrived by water. They skirmished through the trees. Many times this happened, and they left things behind them. Some of the things they left behind were intangible, memories and feelings and some were solid reality. The largest hoard of Viking gold ever found in Europe was unearthed on this small island. The intangible relics are not altogether friendly. The nature god of the ancient world was Pan. He's also the god of panic. He seems to be here, laughing, somewhere in the bracken. I remember that bracken is a very long-lived plant, longer than the oldest oak tree. Somehow this seems significant and even sinister. The choking green fronds have a fresh sweaty smell, the smell of panic. Come from the holy fire, purn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. There are treasures of another kind which still survive, botanical treasures. An awful lot of Ireland has been sort of completely scrunched up and eaten out by cattle by now. But here and there you get little gems, little fields where, where the cattle haven't done their worst. And suddenly you get the lot. I mean, you get orchids, you get lots and lots and lots of different flowering plants. Uh, something comes in, I say a seed falls on the ground. If that seed fell on the ground in the east of Ireland, the cows would be long, the sheep would be long, they'd wipe it out in 10 seconds. Uh, but over here within the Shannon system, uh, you know, just looking around here on Hare Island, there's what? five, six, seven cattle on a whole island. So really, the amount of pressure that's on any young plant that's trying to become established is very, very slight here. That means that these things can get in and get established and sort of get up to maybe two, three metres high before they're likely to be browsed by anything. 
This is one of the rarest Irish roses. It's a thing called Rosa agrestis, the lesser sweetbriar. There are, as far as I know, there are only two sites left for it in the south of England. Uh, in Ireland, we've got 15 to 20 different sites, depending on what you call a site. If you like, it's a sort of a, a survival of the old agricultural landscape that we had two, three hundred years ago. The pink-flowered one is a thing called, that's oh, a lovely one, it's a thing called a, the downy rose. The, the leaves are actually covered with soft felt on the back. Most of the stuff that you get in the east of Ireland, again, is sort of poor hybrid material by now. But over here, where the true ordinary dog rose is very, very uncommon, it seems as if it hasn't had a chance to breed to the same extent with this one. So as a result of that, what you're seeing here is very, very pure stock. You know, people get a bit over, you know, I think excessively worked up about orchids for, for various reasons because they obviously have a certain sort of appeal. But really at the same time, the orchids are, um, if you like, they're a symptom. They're an expression of, of something being right with the world. We leave Trisha Island and there are many symptoms of something being right with the world. The sun shines, all the panic has evaporated. Birds sing. When a boat lifts to a wave, my heart lifts with it. I wish I could sing too, but my best friends have long since told me that this isn't a great idea. Everyone tells me I have a great life. They don't really know what they're talking about, of course, but I suppose they're right in some ways, even if I can't make music. Instead, I turn the boat for the water labyrinth of the inner lakes, a sheltered, gentle place, a place where the truism comes true, and boating really is the ultimate in relaxation. Or maybe it's a little more complicated than that. Maybe the nicest part of boating is when you stop, like banging your head against the brick wall, when you stop and tie up at another quiet jetty and chat to people in the sunshine. Well, basically, we make our living through renting mooring space and uh, repairs and maintenance to most of the craft here. We, we build some boats, we used to build some boats, but uh, not so much now. Peter Quigley, before I joined him, he built a lot of the Shannon One designs for the uh, local Lockery and Lockdown Yacht Club. And uh, fishing boats for the lake, the lake boats here, the standard lockery, he started off in wooden boats and then he graduated to fiberglass. Well, after leaving school, um, I served my time to the tra traditional boat building here on the Shannon with a man by the name of Walter Living in Cousin, who was an old man there. And when I finished my time there with him, he gave me, he was retiring at the time, and he gave me practically his goodwill as well, which was a great benefit to me and there were timber fishing boats, Shannon One design boats that we were building at the time, and I continued on in that tradition for some years. Boating on the Shannon is changing a bit. People are going more and more for the cruisers now. Cruisers, big cruisers were here years and years back, big sailing cruisers on the Shannon. Now they're coming back again, and perhaps maybe slightly in a different form, some sailing boats and some cruisers, and people are looking for easy, easy access to these boats. As I slip Scolivar out into the calm water and thread a passage through the moored boats, I realize that this waterway is about industry and tourism, about jobs and potential. It always has been. The Midlands of Ireland have a resource that can be sensibly exploited. Dick Carney's days are gone. There are no more barge loads of grain and beer on the river, but there is still commerce of a kind. 
Today the cargo is pleasure, the trade is an enjoyment. To find out what our earliest ancestors enjoyed is not easy. We can go back to ancient manuscripts, search for clues in old religions and oral traditions, piece together fragments. What emerges is consistent, the most fundamental of all human pleasures, crossing all barriers of time and culture, is an enjoyment of the beauties of nature. It's the ultimate aesthetic experience, and we have to visit no gallery, library or cinema. All we have to do is open our eyes and allow ourselves a sense of wonder, as people always have. Well, the frog is, is amphibious and it's got a very um, soft skin that it has to keep moist all the time. It, it breathes through its skin as well as through its lungs. So it needs, um, it needs to stay in damp areas. It doesn't have, it's not very good in dry areas. It needs to stay in damp areas. So they tend to be found in, say, deep grass or uh, bogland areas uh, in the vicinity of ponds, uh, brushes, lakes, rivers, that sort of thing. They live to seven, eight, nine years old in Ireland. The older frogs have been found in other countries, but in Ireland it would be around eight years, the maximum age. Um, most frogs would probably, they mature, they breed for the first time at two or three years of age. Um, but most frogs would probably die off by the time they're five or six. But the oldest that I have found anyway is, is about eight years old. I would guess that given all the land drainage and stuff that's going on, um, particularly in the eastern part of the country over the last 20 years, um, I would say that there's been a pretty significant decline in frog populations because uh, a lot of ponds and uh, waterways that they would have used for breeding have, been, have disappeared over the last 20 years. Um, in the west of Ireland I would say that, that they're still, you know, they're doing pretty well. It's time to switch off daydreaming mode. There's work to be done. The lake must be crossed and pathetic fallacies have to be temporarily shelved while we accept that nature can also be an adversary. Every time I take the tiller of a boat in my fist and head across open water, I get a thrill. It's hard to describe exactly. A feeling of power, independence, excitement. I think one of the attractions of boat travel is that it's always an adventure. Childish, maybe, but also rejuvenating, and why not? St. Brendan's motives for tackling the Western Ocean were not purely spiritual. Those Vikings built a world empire on their taste for daring voyages. Adventure is an underestimated engine of achievement.
Apart from adventure, there's something else which makes water travel very different. There's the immense sense of isolation it can produce. Isolation which frees the mind to travel in unexpected directions, to make connections, to hear what is seldom heard, to see the invisible. I revel in this journey. Let's keep her going.